Okay, I think we can uh, start. Uh, my name is uh, Alessandro Franci, and uh, I have the pleasure to introduce the talk of um, uh, Giacomo Rizzieri. Giacomo is a PhD researcher at the Politecnico di Milano. He's also a structural engineer for the Politecnico di Milano. Uh, Giacomo spent uh, a stay period here in uh, Barcelona and since November 2023 until today. So, uh, <laughs> This is the best day to make uh, questions. Um, in this respect, I would like to remember uh, everybody that in uh, Coffee Talk, you can interrupt the speaker during his presentation. So if you have some uh, question during uh, yeah, the Takumo's presentation, you can uh, interrupt it. Okay, Takumo is in your talk. Thank you, Alessandro, for the nice introduction. And welcome everybody. Uh, today I want to present to you uh, some recent advances in my research regarding numerical simulation with complex fluid, uh, mainly for uh, 3D printing applications. So, okay, uh, as Alessandro has already introduced me, so I'm actually enrolled in the third year of my PhD at Politecnico di Milano, and I finished my four months here to further develop my research. So let's go directly to the plan of the talk. I will start with a very brief introduction on additive manufacturing. Then I'll present you the theoretical numerical model that we developed and the specific tools that we, um, we try to, to, to build to create a, a, a 3D printing framework inside our numerical model. And finally, I will show you how to implement some uh, more complex constitutive laws like viscoplastic and viscoelastic geological laws, which are uh, um, representative uh, of uh, fresh concrete and polymers, respectively. Okay, so let's start with a um, brief introduction. So additive manufacturing, um, for example, with polymers is used in a Nowadays, it's well affirmed and used in a wide variety of applications from medical, healthcare to prototyping. And also, there are a lot of different processes involved. Here, I will focus uh, most of all on uh, extrusion based um, um, additive manufacturing, meaning that the, the material, which is generally, for example, a polymer, so a viscoelastic material, is pushed inside the nozzle and then extruded in order to create a continuous filament. So we can exploit this technique to build complex shapes and objects with the workflow I have um, reported here at the bottom of the slide. So the designer will start with a CAD geometry, then uh, he will use uh, slicing software to create a toolpath, and finally the toolpath will, uh, will be translated into a series of instructions, which uh, are generally called the G-code, and this is what we, it will be passed to the machine, to the 3D printer, and we tell the machine how to move in space, how to extrude the material, how fast, and all this type of information. So now if we take this idea and we scale it uh, in dimensions, we can do something very similar for concrete, which is called the 3D concrete printing. It's a type of additive manufacturing technique. And we can build structural components layer after layer uh, by extruding a cementitious mortar. This is what you can see here in the video at the right. This is, was done by ETH Zurich. And this is a structural component, part of a pedestrian bridge. And you can obviously, this is not the real velocity, but still you can appreciate the fact that the construction times are quite fast. They involve only minimal human labor. And also, we are able to put the material exactly where it's needed with the very precise uh, motions. So we are also saving material and possibly uh, money. Okay. Obviously, such a, a complex process um, necessitates to be very well controlled uh, in order to produce a nice object in the end. In fact, as we, as we have seen uh, earlier, everything should be planned in advance from the beginning. So numerical tools, of course, can help a lot in order to uh, foresee whether we can print a certain material and uh, what is uh, the degree of the accuracy that we can get. 
basically at the moment, especially for 3D printing of concrete, there are uh, the, the, the numerical models are all under development. We find uh, solid continuum models in which uh, finite elements are activated one after the other, so in a, in a layer wise fashion. And these are generally used to um, simulate the, the entire production process to check whether, for example, the object will collapse during printing or not. And then we have um, discrete and fluid models, which are a little bit more expensive. So they are generally used to um, check at the scale of the filament, what is the shape of the filament, uh, what, um, what uh, uh, specific um, geometrical characteristic um, can, can, can be get. So I, in particular, um, in, in my talk, I will present to you a fluid continuum model, which um, <clears throat> Uh, we have been developing and can work for concrete, but also polymers in principle. So the main assumption is that uh, we have uh, an homogeneous fluid. So the governing equations are the Nugget-Stokes equations. We will uh, uh, write the equation under these three assumptions. The first one is uh, the, that we will write them for the generic framework of the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian. Uh, we will see this in the next slide then a weakly compressible fluid and isothermal condition. This is quite a strong assumption, but for the moment we are using it. And if we add compatibility, constitutive law, and so on, in the end, we can get a system of five scalar equations in five unknowns, which are the free velocity component, the pressure, and the density. So why the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian description? This will be clear later on. We need this kind of framework to uh, impose some uh, challenging boundary conditions, for example, at the nozzle outlet. But uh, the main idea uh, that, uh, is uh, that this is a more general framework in which the mesh movements becomes decoupled from the material movement. So we have these two velocities, the one associated to the mesh and the one associated to the material. The relative velocity between the two is called convective velocity. And in the Navier-Stokes equation, it will appear a term which contains this convective velocity. Then if you look here at the bottom, um, by setting the value of the mesh velocity, we can recover either the Eulerian or the Lagrangian formulation. Because when the, when the convective term is zero, by setting the mesh velocity, equal to the uh, velocity we get the, um, the Lagrangian formulation and vice versa. In my, uh, in my model, as you will see later, we will treat most of the domain as Lagrangian, but some, bound, some boundary nodes for the boundary condition as arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian, associating a, a mesh velocity, which is uh, um, typical of the 3D printing motion. Okay, so here you see the governing equation written in strong form. And of course, also some in an initial set of uh, boundary condition, initial condition to close uh, mathematically the problem, of course. And as you see in the balance of linear momentum, we have the convective term due to the Lagrange, arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian uh, framework. And uh, until now, we also left the Cauchy stress tensor written as it is. But of course, we need to specify the Cauchy stress tensor expression. So generally, in fluid mechanics, it is um, decomposed into its volumetric and deviatoric part. The volumetric part is proportional to the pressure. And the deviatoric part is generally uh, assigned by means of a rheological law. So the most simple case of rheological law is the one of water, for example, in which we assume a linear relation between the deviatory um, between the deviatoric stress tensor and the deviatoric strain rate tensor. And in particular, the linear relation is linked to the uh, viscosity, which is eta, and which, of course, for a standard Newtonian fluid is constant. We will see later on some more complex rheological models. Okay, going on, we... Uh, we write in uh, the weak form all the equations. We adopt linear shape functions, and the reason for this also will be uh, clarified later. 
and we get the semi discretized in space equations, which are this print. Then, of course, we also need to uh, discretize the equation in time. We decided to do this with a central difference scheme, which is a second order accurate, but uh, also conditionally stable, meaning that at each time step, we need to satisfy the uh, CFL condition. And therefore, the maximum time step that we can use in the analysis is limited by the minimum dimension of the distorted elements in the mesh. So this is quite uh, uh, challenging because it means that if our mesh becomes distorted, the time step of the analysis will become very low and it will be very difficult to go on with the analysis. So for all these reasons, uh, I will show introduce now the particle finite element method. So until now, I just presented a framework in which we which is basically a Lagrangian finite element technique. What happens is that when we start to solve the equation of motion in a Lagrangian framework, as you can see in the second figure, the domain will start to deform, and also the computational mesh will start to get more and more distorted. Of course, if the mesh becomes too distorted, we can expect uh, uh, inaccuracy, instability problems, and also that the time step in our explicit framework will become very small. So this is why we need to fix this problem. And to do it in the particle finite element method, um, we operate a remeshing procedure. Basically we, basically, we remove the mesh. We save all information at the nodes. We generate a new mesh. You can see it here, for example, with the, the Launi triangulation algorithm. And from the new mesh, we need to recover the, uh, the physical domain because the new mesh created has also some elements which are not uh, belonging to the physical domain. So a way to distinguish between physical and non-physical elements is through the alpha shape criterion, which is based on distortion. So the elements which are excessively, the new elements created which are excessively distorted, so the red ones, will be deleted. And in the end, we get the initial deformed domain, but with a good mesh. So this is the core of the PFM. Uh, this technique has several advantages because uh, being the most of our domain in Lagrange, Lagrange, we don't have the convective term. So the, all the nonlinearities linked to the convective term, we don't have to deal with them. Also the free surface is struct. We don't need uh, interface uh, capturing techniques uh, like uh, is generally done in Eulerian solvers. And finally, uh, we can deal with large displacement through the remeshing, but also merging and separation of the domain. As you can see in this simulation of a water droplet impacting on a container, you can see that there is uh, uh, two portions which are merging and then separating. However, there are also some uh, aspects which are a little bit more challenging in the PFM, such as how to guarantee a good quality mesh, especially in, in 3D. Sometimes it's not sufficient to just remake, make a new mesh. Sometimes we also have to add other techniques to improve the mesh quality. Then uh, we are limited to triangular and to triangular elements, so only linear shape function finite elements, because, of course, if we are going to if only the material nodes when we do a remeshing and then generate a new mesh, we cannot deal with uh, finite elements which have nodes which are not linked to uh, the material nodes. And finally, we also have a problem of how can we transfer historical variables at the level of the element. So for example, if we need stresses and we are the stresses are at the, at the level of the element, but we are going to delay the elements because during the remeshing, so how can we transfer this data? These are problems that we will try to address later on. And it's the simulation for the 3D case. Drop of water, you see that the mesh starts to become very difficult to be managed. Okay, so coming now, till now it was the PFM. Now we, I will show you some of the techniques that we use to simulate extrusion and 3D printing inside the PFM. So first of all, I told you before that most of our domain will be treated as Lagrangian. 
but this uh, line here in 2D or uh, a circle in 3D will be materialized with arbitrary Lagrangian points in order to uh, assign to uh, boundary conditions on the velocity at the same time. Because we need to assign that the nozzle it will be translating in space with a certain velocity. And at the same time, we need also need to assign that the material is flowing down with a certain velocity. And of course, these two uh, velocities are independent and can vary independently, both in magnitude and in direction. So uh, the arbitrary Lagrangian layer and framework comes in here because we can assign the printing velocity to the mesh and we can assign the material velocity as a standard boundary condition on the, on the nodes. So what will happen in this framework is that the Lagrangian nodes will start to flow down. As they flow down, because uh, of their, their Lagrangian nature, the elements in between will start to stretch. And so at a certain point, we are forced to put some new nodes in the middle. And in this way, we create the continuous flow of the material out of the nozzle. Uh, here is a um, simple example in which uh, we are printing on a curvilinear surface in 2D. And in particular, you will appreciate the fact that we are imposing two velocities, horizontal and vertical components of the velocity for the translation of the nozzle, and additionally, uh, the velocity at which the flow is coming out. And this is possible because of what I told you before of the framework that we have implemented. The difference between the Eulerian and the Lagrangian framework. So what is the Eulerian, the, the, the LA framework? Yes. Um, well, if you look, for example, in this figure, all the domain this is Lagrangian. It's all, all, it's all Lagrangian except for a small line of elements, small line of uh, nodes here. The, the, just the day flow. Just the day flow is materialized with, uh, with nodes, which, so imagine that. Just that what you need elements. So you, yes. The first line of elements, just the first line of elements are. No, no, the first line of nodes. So the, the, the square nodes. So let's imagine that our nozzle is not translating, but it's fixed, fixed, and we just have the material flowing down. If we are in this simplified case, these nodes are Eulerian, and all the other nodes are Lagrangian. And in this way, the Eulerian node will stay fixed, the Lagrangian nodes will flow down, and we have new Lagrangian nodes in the middle. Additionally to this, this, this Eulerian node in our framework are not truly Eulerian, but they are arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian because they are not fixed, but they move with a constant velocity. Yeah, but when you are applying the equation. Yes. You are applying the, the balance equation with and without the contraction term to exactly. elements, no? Um, with domain, <coughs> yes, so we, not only the nodes must be part of the domain that must be LA. No? We are solving the equations. So, is the first line of element must be a LA? Yes, but uh, we are solving the equation explicitly. So, in the end, our uh, the the contribution the, the equations are solved at each node as a balance of. Uh, Forces at each node. So, okay. okay. And why explicit solution? Explicit integration. Yeah, why? Because we can deal, uh, I will get, no, yes, because we can deal better with nonlinearities. Um, we don't have. Which is the, the size of the, the you, you were talking about the time step. The time step, which is the time step that you can use for this kind of, for this example, for instance? Uh, it, it usually depends on the size of the right. Compared to the size of the element. The size of one element or two elements, half of it, how much? It's uh, the, the size of the elements divided by the velocity of the propagation wave. 
So, for example, so very small time steps. Very small. Extremely small. I would say that if in this, if we use implicit, we could use a time step like of uh, one, one over one over one thousand seconds. In in the explicit, we will use uh, something like one to the power of the minus five. So at least two or three orders of magnitude less. And this compensate the the choice of using uh, explicit. Probably not. And that's that's why uh, the, my work here with the supervision Alessandro was in fact, fact to introduce an implicit time integration scheme. So mm -hmm. to to better deal with this problem. Thanks. No problem. Okay. Anyway, we will see something also at, at the end. Okay. Okay. So now there are a few slides a bit specific about PFM. Um, a standard problem in PFM is that when we, uh, that uh, the, the, the boundaries, for example, a rigid plane, are generally uh, materialized in advance by placing nodes, fixed nodes. And when the flow, when the material arrives near the boundary, some elements will form in between. And through this mechanism, we have uh, that the flow will be confined by the boundaries. This as an intrinsic problem that some mass variation can occur because we are creating new elements which are not really part of the domain. And especially in 3D printing can cause some large variations in time on the total mass that we are printing. So we try to implement a slightly different uh, approach in which uh, we don't materialize, not, we don't put any points in the constraint, we simply have the material flowing but we check the position of the points in time. And whenever they satisfy a certain positional constraint, for example, Z less, than or equal, less or equal than zero, we are going to impose in strong form the initial boundary condition. And in this way, we obtain uh, mass variations, which are very, very small. You can see the results here on the profile of the layer that is being printed. So it's not clear what if you put the, 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 the nodes in advance, in standard FM, they put, will, will be in theta equal to zero. Will be? On theta equal to zero. If we put the nodes in advance, if you don't put in advance, will be something close to, because you will remove the ones exactly. that are very far, meaning very, very negative. And you keep the one that are very close to theta equal to zero. Yes. And then how do you control? First, how do you control the, 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 the mass? Well, there is no mass loss in the second case because the nodes are simply being, it's like they are free. Can you see the difference between the two? In the first, there are some elements which are being created between the nodes we put. Um, yeah, this is true, but if, if, if you wait for the material to move, the material will move forward while it's also flowing down. In this case, it cannot flow down until the, this line, which that's what will happen physically, because some elements will form in the middle, increasing the volume. Yeah, but in the other one, it will be element in the other, below the theta. No, 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 no elements. In the other one, the nodes will go down, 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 and at a certain point, they become fixed. So there is but not exactly on zero equal to zero. Maybe not exactly on zero equal to zero, but since we are in a specific framework, the time step is very small. So this variation is of the order of a fraction of a fraction of a millimeter, so negligible. In an implicit framework, this poses some other challenges yeah. which are being addressed. The research lab. Okay. Something similar, a little bit more complicated, so I try to not spend too much time on this slide. We have developed to reduce mass losses when we have contact between different layers. So once again, we do something similar, but in this case, first of all, we try to avoid situation in which finite elements are 
not uh, um, are, are joining different layers. So like this red element here is a situation that we try to avoid in our mesh because it's unclear if the elements belong to the upper layer or to the lower layer. We can control this by um, performing some operation on the mesh, for example, refining the free surface or the refining the, the free surface. Once we are sure that in our mesh that we are always in a situation similar to this, so there is a clear distinction between elements on the lower layer and on the top layer, uh, what will happen is we start monitoring the we start monitoring the, the elements that are forming in between. We are deleting these elements. So also the green element is being deleted with the alpha shade. And as we delete it, we also, before deleting, we check its area. And when the area becomes very low, we remove some of the nodes, we perform the remeshing. And in this way, by performing the remeshing, the layers are joining. So I don't know if this is very clear because it's, it's a modification. We can see it as a modification of the standard alpha shape in PFM. So of course, uh, it's a bit complex. But the point is that we found out it works very well. I will show you in a minute some examples. Finally, let me introduce the last uh, computational uh, tool that we introduced, which is an adaptive refinement. You see here an example. Basically, uh, in the nozzle, we want a very refined mesh. But in the rest of the domain, we don't need such a refined mesh. So we remove points. And in this way, we obtain a huge reduction in computational times. But uh, to this huge reduction in computational times, we don't have a huge reduction also in accuracy. Like accuracy is still good. And this is because the geometric criterion, which is at the base of this derefinement technique, is reflecting the velocity field. In particular, near the nozzle, we have a high, uh, very uh, high gradient in the velocity field, in the solution. So we want a refined mesh. In the rest of the layer, the velocity is almost constant. So we can accept a coarser mesh. OK, so. Now that the three-finger framework is more or less clear, uh, let me start to introduce some uh, uh, different uh, rheological models, because of course we cannot print water. So concrete is the first material I want to focus on. Concrete has this specific behavior that at the low strain rates, it behaves as a solid. But when we uh, vibrate it, so we it is subjected to high strain rates, it will behave as a fluid. This is exactly the same material we tested in our lab. And this behavior is what allows concrete to be printable. This is some tests that we did in collaboration with the Indian Institute of Tirupati. And you see concrete is printable mainly because of this behavior. So it's being vibrated in the nozzle. And then when it, it flows out, and then there is the strain rate is low and it can keep its shape. Mathematically, we can use the Bingham model to reproduce this phenomenon. You can see it in 3D written on the top. But uh, to understand how it works, let's look at the 1D case. Basically, the, we um, assume that there is a yield stress. What is the yield stress? Basically, below a certain threshold in the stresses, the material behaves as a rigid body. When this threshold is overcome, the material starts to flow. Okay. Of course, we don't we didn't implement directly this law because it's quite complex to be implemented. There is a singular point, and to deal with these two conditions, it's not easy. So we implement a, an exponential approximation, which is called Bingham Papanastasi law, which uh, for very high value of the exponent we recover a, cu a curve which is very similar to the Bingham law. OK. Very yes, very nonlinear. 
So here are some examples. The slump test, for example, is a standard of the test that is performed on concrete to check its workability. And you can see we can reproduce it in 2D and in 3D. And we can deal with this very large displacement in the domain by means of the remeshing technique I explained before. OK, let's get to the point of 3D printing. Here we printed three filaments with uh, the same material. So zero for the Wingal law is the 630 pascals, but different printing velocities. And we get very different uh, filament shapes. Of course, to get fi uh, different filament shapes, we will have different velocity fields and pressure fields. In particular, I think it's interesting to look at the pressure because this is a parameter which is relevant while we print something because high pressures can cause failure. So of course, the model gives us also the, the pressure distribution. Uh, we validated the filament geometry by extracting the cross sections and comparing them with the experimental results which are available, available in the literature. We found a very good uh, accordance. So we validated both our numerical framework for video printing and the implementation of the Bingham law. Uh, here are a case in which we print instead uh, three layers. You see that the contact algorithm is working nicely because the, there is a quite smooth surface between the two, the two layers. We don't have many elements forming in between. So the volume is conserved. Also in this case, we uh, extracted a cross section, compared it with the experimental results, and we found out a very good agreement. Little less good for the last. Probably the, this was a problem of compressibility. Okay, of course, once the model is validated, it can be used to simulate more complex geometry. For example, a circular one. Our code is taking in input the G code, so it acts similar to a virtual 3D printer. <laughs> and so it can simply reproduce the toolpaths and print this different shapes. Another interesting application is uh, to, to check if the code is able to reproduce um, collapse due to instability behaviors during printing. This is something which has been observed experimentally. It's actually something very, which happens very often. If you print too fast, or the, the mechanical parameters in the material are not uh, developing fast enough. So if the material doesn't become stiff enough, it can cause uh, buckling failure. And we reproduce it. We try to reproduce a similar um, failure mechanism. And we were quite happy to see that our framework was able to reproduce it. And since the time integration is explicit, we are able to uh, treat this without any difficulties. Why we know that in an implicit framework, dealing with buckling sometimes may, uh, can cause problems. And we need, especially for convergence of the nonlinear um, non solvers. OK, coming to the last part, viscoelastic flows. So, yes. This is like not taking into account the, the hardening of the material, because it, it, it's fluid all the time with the same properties. Uh, exactly. We implemented also, I'm not showing here. There is no aging. There is no aging. Because generally, for uh, printing of a uh, few layers, so in the first few minutes, aging is not so relevant in 3D concrete printing. If we start uh, dealing with something like, uh, I don't know, 50 layers, 20, 50 layers, aging, aging becomes very important. Yeah, the second question is more relevant. There are no stresses. There are no stresses. Meaning you are not generating the stiffness of the material. And if you don't have stiffness, it is like a fluid all the time. It is a viscous fluid, but it's a fluid. It I, just depends on the strain rate. I wouldn't I would not say the strain rate is zero. 
So when it is not when moving, it is zero, then it's zero. Exactly. When it, I would not say it's a fluid because it's a fluid only in the moment well, while it's flowing. But after it's deposed, this is acting as a rigid body until the, the, the stresses inside build up and overcome the yield stress. At that point, it will start to flow again. So it's viscoplastic. Yeah, yeah, but uh, there are no elasticity stresses. Don't have any stress no, exactly. So if you want to build any kind of structure, you don't, you never see the stresses that generate any. Yes, you're right. That's quite a problem because for it is for the next slide. But in case of, of Plastic filaments, I mean, this, this solidify. Yes. Okay. Okay. No, 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 you're right. You're right. Yeah. You cannot see the, the stresses because you just know that we are below the yield stress if the material is at rest, but we don't know what is the stress level inside. That's a problem. That's why we try to develop this scholastic uh, model. Because in the end, I have not done it here. I've not, I've not done it yet. But in the end, we would like to achieve a viscoelastoplastic model. In this way, also stress, the stress state is known uh, univocally. Okay. Okay. So visco viscoelastic fluids, um, for example, polymers or biological fluids, are generally composed of a solvent matrix, which is a Newtonian viscous fluid. And inside this matrix, we have a microstructure. For example, in the case of polymer, the microstructure is, are, is composed of diluted polymers. And the um, most standard model used in viscoelasticity of flows is probably the old Roy B model. You can see it represented schematically for the 1D case there. And it is composed of this of two contributions. The Newtonian viscous stresses, which are arising because of the contribution of the matrix. And a second contribution coming to the stress to the deviatoric stress tensor coming from the pol from the polymeric um, chains. So you see here that these two parts are in parallel, so the contribution are summing up. And in particular, the challenging task here is to compute the polymeric stress tensor, so the contribution coming from the polymer. To do it, we need to solve this equation, in which we, it appears the upper convective derivative. Here I've written the upper convective derivative for, uh, in, for its length. And this derivative is necessary because the model must be um, frame invariant. So, at each time step, we will need to solve this equation. However, since we are in a Grandson point of view, the convective term can be disregarded. This simplifies a lot all the, uh, all the computations because we get an ordinary differential equation because now the polymeric stress tensor is only derived with respect to time. We don't have derivative with respect to space. So we can discretize in time, for example, with the forward L Euler scheme, the time derivative. And we get, in the end, the expression at the bottom, which says that the polymeric, the updated polymeric stress tensor is given by the old polymeric stress tensor plus uh, an increment. And now, the final uh, problem to be solved is how can we ensure that we get, we are always able to get the old version at the, pre, uh, at the previous time step of the polymeric stress tensor in the PFM? Because in PFM we have remeshing. So when we have remeshing, we are going to lose the information in the Gauss point regarding the old polymeric stress tensor. A possible solution, which we propose here, is to uh, so let's suppose that. We have already have from that in, in the previous time step, there was no remeshing. So, in this case, we know the old polymeric stress tensor and we can compute the increment and compute the, the value. A 
However, before solving the equations, what we do is we save only the increment in the polymer of the polymeric stress tensors at the nodes by means of an averaging process like this one, which we, we save the, the variable at the nodes. Then the remeshing is performed. And after the remeshing, the information about the polymeric stress tensor is reconstructed in the Gauss point, starting from what we saved previously at the nodes. Of course, this procedure will, um, will cause some smoothing of the variables. But since we are uh, only uh, averaging the, and uh, saving the increments, this smoothing is very contained. OK, so finally, let's see some application of viscoelasticity. Uh, this is the uh, standard benchmark in viscoelasticity, the fall of a drop of fluid onto a rigid plate. On the left, you can see the Newtonian fluid. And then we see two viscoelastic fluids with different Reynolds numbers. You can see that the Newtonian fluid is just flowing, while the viscoelastic uh, flows behave very differently. One is expanding more and then contracting, while the second one is bouncing. We validated uh, in terms of the width of the drop, the results with uh, other results from the literature to check that our implementation was correct. Uh, we also tried to change the Weissenberg number, which is a quite um, useful quantity in this elasticity. It's the ratio between the relaxation time of the fluid and the characteristic time of the process. And generally, the, when Weissenberg number becomes very high, uh, numerical codes can uh, um, and, and undergo instabilities. But for this specific, specific case, in our implementation, we did not find any problem. Probably if we go to other ex more challenging examples, we may have. Now a second example, which brings us towards 3D printing. In this case, we have a flow, which is impacting a rigid surface. And the flow after the impact will start to go into buckling. You can see again the Newtonian and the viscoelastic flow to appreciate the difference. You see that the viscoelastic flow will go become unstable sooner, and then we will start to coil. Uh, we did the same also for the 3D case. The results are analogous. And um, okay. Finally, we apply this to a very um, simplified case of 3D printing. I say simplified because we take uh, a generic viscoelastic material, we don't include a, a phase, transi phase transition or thermal effect. But uh, I think what is nice is you can see the relaxation time. So what you see plotted are the elastic strain tensor norm. So in indication of how the elastic stresses are generated. And you see that the elastic stresses are disappearing in time on a time scale which is linked to the relaxation parameter. Okay. Uh, Okay, so I reached the end. Present you the general framework to reproduce 3D printing in with the PFM. Two types of viscoelastic, two types of logical load, the viscoplastic and viscoelastic. And the future goals are get to an implicit time integration scheme to try to save some computational time and to implement an elastic viscoplastic constitutive law, which could be probably more, more representative both for concrete and polymers. Um, these are some references, especially the one on viscoelasticity is not uh, uh, published yet, but it has been uh, accepted for a publication. So we hope that by the soon enough it will be available.
Okay. Uh, thank you all for the attention. And if you have any questions, I think we can answer. Thank you, Tamu, for a very, very nice presentation. Uh, do we have some questions? Kevin? Just to give it, it's not mandatory. The, I mean, I know that right now is not your priority, but how long is it the simulation, like the 3D extrusion that you show? Like this one? For instance. For instance, this one took me uh, four days. Three or four days. Yes. It's a serial implementation. It's parallel, but uh, OpenMP. And we did not run it on a supercomputer, just on a standard computer. So it was running with eight cores on a standard computer. Uh, I would say the main limitation of the time computer step, yeah. is the time step. Yes. So it's, the time step here was like one to the power of the minus six or seven. But then it uses this applet uh, a little bit slow to that today, but even if you add the this elasticity, this elasticity is disappearing in time because of the viscous relaxation. Uh, so if you, you, are, you are not accumulating stresses because of the eventually the altering of the material or the weight of the of the next layer or whatever. You don't have, you are not generating stresses in the Lagrangian. No, the, the, the reason why we are not uh, generating stresses is because it's a viscoelastic fluid. So in time, the stresses will disappear. Yeah. But it's still a fluid. I mean, it's still a fluid. That's, but if we, um, what we will, will try to do is to add uh, elastic stresses also in the Bingham model, for example, below the threshold, as if the material, instead of behaving as a rigid body, it can be as a solid. Uh, um, elastic body, and that stresses in that case will, will not disappear. And this is the viscoelastic uh, fluid. I think it's not really representative of how we should uh, introduce it. So it can suggest how to introduce them, but it's still a fluid. We we need to add in the model, for example, in parallel a spin to, to get it to get it to a solid. <laughs> Much. How is your D refinement implemented? Uh, okay, uh, the, re the refinement is implemented on second. Yes, basically we are uh, removing nodes outside of a certain geometrical region. And after you remove the nodes, you perform a new mesh with the developing algorithm. So the nice thing about DFM is we need any way to really generate the mesh at certain points, so in time. So we exploit it also to do the, the, the adaptive their point. The, the, the refinement and the do you lose information about the gas forms? Uh, not very much because it told that it's zero because it, the pressure disappears. So when the velocity is almost zero, then we, we are the losing uh, uh, the we are losing some of the nodes, so we are losing information in that nodes, but not really in the Gauss points. I mean, because after during the, the refine, we recreate the mesh, so we no, lose everything. No, but I think when, when, you, when you create the big, the big node, the big elements are drawn for the information to the lower points, the accuracy of the. Ah, uh, no, no, we're not doing it. No, no. You can say nothing because there's nothing to say. Any other question? When you will adapt, when you will, you will add the uh, elasticity or whatever, this will be a problem. Right? Yeah, yes. This is the question. <clears throat> I think so. Because we are losing the information store, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, but I guess there is uh, also some interest in the fluid part of this uh, yes, yes. of this simulation. I mean, yeah, until now, I mean, the, the, as I showed in the beginning, there are two levels. The, the level of 
the scale of the object and the scale of the filament. When we are at the scale of the filament, so two, three layers, the main idea is to check how the nozzle, the velocities, the, so the, how the parameters are interacting with the material properties. So in this case, I think the fluid is more than enough. Then if we want to approach buildability, I'm speaking about concrete, not polymers. If we want to approach buildability, so several uh, layers, then uh, we need uh, to switch to a different framework. To conclude, I would like to remark that the work that uh, Giacomo did on uh, remeshing, it's quite complicated. It's difficult to, to, to sell and difficult to, to explain, but uh, all the, the work he did for uh, uh, reducing, uh, to improve mass conservation was uh, remarkable. So I would like to emphasize it. Okay, okay. so uh, we can thank uh, the speaker again. <laughs> You are, you are not uh, in the class. You are not in the. No, no, yes. No, it's a uh, new implementation for Scala. It's the the PFM code was already it was already available. Was implemented by a supervisor, Ms. Milan Cremonesi. Cremonesi. I added the part about the printing and the scalability.